Hi, and welcome to LIGO Learn. In this video, I'm going to give you a primer on the lambda calculus. The aim is to give you a basic understanding of the theoretical underpinnings of functional programming. We will start by discussing what the lambda calculus actually is. Then we will move on to understanding how we can define functions in the lambda calculus, and then more concretely define the simple untyped version. Following that, we will discuss the calculus's evaluation rules and reduction orders. And finally, we will briefly cover the church rosser theorems, which are useful to know when it comes to the lambda calculus. You will see, as you go on, that understanding the lambda calculus gives you a solid base to understand the theory behind functional programming. And my experience has been that students who are first exposed to the lambda calculus theory before trying to learn functional programming have an easier time later on. Let's crack on to the module content. So, what exactly is the lambda calculus? Well, the lambda calculus is a formal system for expressing computation developed by Alonzo Church. You can see a picture of Church on the right. He was born in 1903 and died in 1995 in the United States. It's called the lambda calculus because, as you will see later, the Greek letter lambda is used to define expressions and terms within the system. There are many variants of the lambda calculus which exist today, including the simple, untyped lambda calculus, the simple typed lambda calculus, system F, the polymorphic lambda calculus, system F omega, a variant of system F with type operators, and others. For this course, we will only cover the simple untyped lambda calculus. For those who are interested in finding out more, I would recommend researching about the Hindley-Milner type system and system F after completing this module. These are quite complicated, and you don't need to know about them, but I'm just mentioning them for those who want to know more. It is often useful to think of the lambda calculus as a sort of assembly language for functional languages. This is because higher level functional programming languages like Haskell, OCaml and others usually translate their source code into an intermediate form of one of the many variants of the lambda calculus. Since it underpins so much when it comes to functional languages, I think it's important that you have a rudimentary understanding of the simple lambda calculus. This will keep you grounded and allow you to understand and appreciate what is happening under the hood when you are actually writing code using a functional language. We define functions within the lambda calculus by using what is known as a lambda abstraction. Before we consider lambda abstractions, let's think of a simple function in the traditional mathematical sense. Let's say we have a function called f, which has a single argument x, and the function body simply adds 1 to x. It is important to note here that the function has a name, which we've called f, just for convention's sake. We say that the function f is applied to the argument x, or more commonly f of x for short. So we can say f of 1 equals 2, and f of 2 equals 3, and so on. Now let's consider the lambda abstraction equivalent. Don't worry that this seems like an alien language right now, I'll explain what it means. Firstly, it starts with the lambda symbol, then an x, then a dot, and then the function body. The lambda symbol denotes that a lambda abstraction is being defined. The x is the formal parameter to the lambda abstraction. A note on the function body. In the lambda calculus, function application is always written in the prefix form, so the plus is always before its arguments. It might be a bit weird to see at first because we are taught to place the plus in an infix position in mathematics classes, but you will get used to it after a while. After all, all it symbolizes is that you need to add x and 1. The position of the plus can be prefixed, infixed or postfixed, depending on the convention you are using. All lambda abstractions have this form. The lambda character, the formal parameter, which we call variable for short, a dot, and then the expression representing the function. Unlike the traditional mathematical function f, the lambda abstraction does not have a name. It is said to be an anonymous function. This is an important point. In the lambda calculus, functions do not have names. They remain anonymous. Sometimes it might be convenient to give a function a name, especially if the function is essentially being repeated, but strictly speaking, it is not necessary. Variables to a function are given a name. In this case, we have given the single variable the name x. So how do we actually apply an argument to the function then? What would be the equivalent of the traditional f of 1 and f of 2? 
You will see in a later section on beta reduction how we define this formally, but for now, just know that you place the argument you want applied to the function after the lambda abstraction, like is shown here. So placing the constant 1 after the lambda abstraction is kind of like f of 1 in the traditional function. It will result in 1 plus 1, which equals 2. We add the additional brackets to remove any ambiguity. This style of applying the argument to the function is known as juxtaposition. Juxtaposition just means putting things next to each other, and juxtaposing the constant 2 after the lambda abstraction is kind of like f of 2, which would result in 2 plus 1, which is 3, and so on. You could, if you wanted to, juxtapose another lambda abstraction after the original lambda abstraction, but we're keeping it simple here for now. So, to summarize, a lambda abstraction is essentially a way of defining a function in the lambda calculus. But what exactly is the lambda calculus? Take a look at the figure which I've taken from the book by Simon Peyton Jones. The book is available for free at the link in the footer. This is a version of the simple untyped lambda calculus, which we will use throughout this module. This definition is written in BNF, which stands for Bacchus Naur form. This is a simple way of describing the syntax of a language. The symbol colon colon equals can be read as is defined as, and the pipe symbol can be read as or. Anything within the less than and greater than sign is a name for a class of symbol within the language. So a constant, or variable, or function application, or lambda abstraction. This may seem slightly complicated right now, but don't worry, you will understand it once I've finished explaining. And so, we can see that the lambda calculus is a language which allows you to define an expression, where an expression is defined as a constant, or a variable, or an expression placed next to another expression, or a lambda abstraction. We've already seen lambda abstractions, so this part should make sense already. The first thing to note about this definition is that it is recursive. That means that the thing we are defining, expression, is defined in terms of itself. For our purposes, we assume that the constants defined include all numbers as well as all inbuilt functions like plus, minus, multiply, divide, and the booleans true and false. Where appropriate, we also allow the usage of brackets to group things. This is to avoid ambiguity. Let's now look at a lambda calculus program. The program is very simple on purpose. Calculate 3 multiplied by 4, which is obviously 12. But the point here is to illustrate how the syntax matches the definition in the figure. So this program is an expression, which only uses two of the definitions to the right of the colon colon equal sign. That is the constant and the expression placed next to the expression. Let's see how this very simple program maps to the syntax in the figure. We go through a transformation sequence which takes 10 steps in total. Firstly, we start with the single expression, which defines a lambda calculus program. Since a single expression can be defined as two expressions placed next to each other, we can replace it with that. Now a single expression can be defined as a constant, so we replace it with that. We can now replace the symbol representing a constant to the actual constant in question, which for us is the multiplication function, which we have assumed to be a built-in constant in our definition of the lambda calculus. Now we can again replace the single expression to two expressions placed next to each other. Like before, we can replace one of the expressions to a constant, and like before, we can replace the constant symbol with the actual constant we want, which is 3. We can then do the same with the last remaining expression, except this time we want it to take the constant value of 4. Additionally, we add the final brackets to the program. You can see now that since the single expression is defined in terms of itself, we can build up a much longer expression, which although in this case was quite simple, could grow to be quite complicated in a real program. So in summary, the lambda calculus is a simple language in which you write programs in. Your entire program is a single expression, and the program is executed by evaluating the expression. In this case, the expression is multiply 3 and 4, which would obviously evaluate to 12 when the program is executed. Here is an exercise you can do to confirm that you have understood everything so far. It is slightly more complicated than the previous example, 
in that we are using the lambda abstraction, you need to create a sequence like I did for the previous slide to show that the following is a valid lambda calculus expression. So start with the expression and build the rest of the sequence. Pause the video here and try it for yourself. It is not that hard but can take some time just to work through each of the steps with a pen and paper. Okay, let's work through the steps. We obviously start with the expression. Then we can replace it with the lambda abstraction. Then we can replace the variable token with a variable name, which we want to be x. We can then replace the single expression with two placed next to each other, i.e. an application. And then we can replace the first expression as a constant, which in this case will be the plus function. We can then replace the single expression with an application, i.e. two expressions next to each other. Now we can replace the first expression with a variable, which we call x. And to get to the final point, we replace the last expression with the constant 1. Hopefully, that wasn't too difficult. And now, you understand how we can build larger and larger expressions in the lambda calculus. So far, we have seen and understood the syntax of the lambda calculus, but that is not enough. We need to be able to take a lambda calculus program and run it and get the corresponding results. For example, imagine a lambda calculus program to calculate the factorial of a number. We need rules to be able to make sure we calculate it correctly. In the next sections, we are going to cover the rules which we follow to evaluate lambda expressions. We'll start with defining some terminology, what bound and free variables are. We need to understand this before we move on to the evaluation rules. We'll then cover delta rules, then beta reduction, then alpha conversion, and finally, eta conversion. Let's consider the following lambda expression. So we have lambda x and the function which adds two variables, x and y. We are also applying the constant 4 to the expression. A binding links a variable name to a value, and so in this expression, the variable name x is bound to the value 4. This is because the lambda abstraction defines the variable name in the abstraction as x. In contrast, within this particular expression, we cannot see the lambda y anywhere, and so the variable y is not bound to a value. It is said to occur free in the expression. The key piece of terminology to note is the usage of the terms bound and free, and that each occurrence of a variable within an expression is said to be either bound or free. We will come back to bound and free variables over the next slides. Delta rules are rules which are used to evaluate built-in functions. They are quite easy to understand. So consider the lambda expression for 4 plus 2. We all know that the answer should be 6, and that this expression should reduce to the value 6. So we reduce it by using a delta rule. Whenever we reach a point in an expression where we are using a primitive function that we know how to reduce, we say we are using a delta rule to reduce it. This is usually denoted with a right arrow showing the direction of the reduction with a delta symbol on top of the arrow. Nothing particularly difficult here. The beta reduction is another rule which can be applied to reduce a lambda expression to a simpler one, but this time it applies to lambda abstractions. Beta reduction is formally defined as the following. This probably looks scary, but I'll explain it further and then you will understand what exactly this notation means. You can read it as a lambda abstraction with a formal parameter named x and a function body of expression e, an argument z is beta reduced by replacing all free occurrences of x in the expression e with z. To be honest, that definition sounds like a bunch of nonsense, so let's make it concrete by looking at an actual example. As we've understood from the previous sections, a lambda abstraction effectively defines an anonymous function. This one has a single variable and the function body just adds one to it. Let's see how the parts of this lambda abstraction relate to the definition above. First, we have the lambda x, which is the same in both. Now, we have the body of the lambda abstraction, 
which I have marked red. This corresponds to the part of the definition denoted by the capital E, and the value 4 corresponds to Z in the definition. Now we want to perform a beta reduction on this expression, and so we first consider the body of the lambda abstraction, that is defined as E in our definition and highlighted in red in our lambda abstraction. We need to see what occurrences of the formal parameter X are free within the body. Remember, it is what is free within the body of the lambda abstraction, not the entirety of the lambda abstraction itself. The body specifically is marked red. When you consider only the bit in red, then there is no lambda X present, and so X occurs free. We will see some more complicated examples when that is not the case in a bit. We can see that the single X is free and not bound within the function body, and so is eligible to be replaced with Z. The result of a beta reduction is a copy of the body of the lambda abstraction with all free occurrences of the formal parameter replaced with the argument. I'll repeat that again because that is the key point here. The result of the beta reduction is a copy of the body of the lambda abstraction with the free occurrences of the formal parameter replaced with the argument. In this case it would mean copying the lambda abstraction's body and replacing X with 4 because X is free within the lambda abstraction's body and we can use a delta rule to reduce this further to 5, which is our final result. That's it. If you are struggling with understanding the notation at the top, then just ignore it. I've only included it within the video for the sake of completeness. And if you still don't understand the free bit, then just wait till the next slide when we go through more examples and it should click. Now let's do a few more beta reductions. Take a look at example 2. The first step in the beta reduction is to consider the lambda abstraction's body. We can see that both occurrences of the variable x occur free within the body. That is because there is no lambda x within the body of the lambda abstraction to bind it. We perform the beta reduction by copying the body of the lambda abstraction and replacing all of the free occurrences of the formal parameter x with the argument 10 and then we can use a delta rule to reduce this expression to 20 to get to the final result. For example 3, it gets slightly more complicated, and this example should hopefully clarify what we mean by free for those who still don't understand. For the first step in the beta reduction, like always, we consider the lambda abstraction's body. You will notice that the body itself is another lambda abstraction, that's absolutely fine, because as we saw on a previous slide, the definition of a lambda abstraction is recursive. Now x occurs free in this expression, but y does not, because there is a lambda y there. So the next step is to copy the body of the lambda abstraction and replace x with the value of the parameter, which was 4. We only replace x because only x is free. The lambda y makes it such that the y is not free, but bound. The lambda expression which is now there after the beta reduction is the inner lambda abstraction from the previous line. Since it is just another reducible expression, we can perform another beta reduction on it. The first step is to consider the lambda abstraction's body. Here we can see that y occurs free within the body, and the next step is to copy the body of the lambda abstraction and replace the free occurrence of the formal parameter y with the value 5 and we can use a delta rule to reduce this further to 1. Hopefully this example cleared up what we mean by free and bound variables. For the final example of beta reduction, consider example 4. Here, the argument to the first lambda abstraction is another lambda abstraction itself. In other words, a function is being given as an argument to another function. Let's beta reduce this. The first step, as always, is to consider the lambda abstraction's body. Here, f occurs free. The next step is to copy the body of the lambda abstraction and replace the free occurrences of the formal parameter with the argument. In this case, the argument was another lambda abstraction, and so we replace it with that. So we now have another lambda abstraction which is reducible. Let's reduce it by performing a beta reduction. The first step is to consider the lambda abstraction's body. 
and we can see that x occurs free in the expression. Next, we copy the body of the lambda abstraction and replace all free occurrences of x with the argument 3. And we can use a delta rule to reduce this to 4. That's it. Hopefully you understand it now. I think it's actually quite intuitive once you have seen a few examples. Now let's consider another lambda expression. Pause the video and as an exercise try to reduce this expression to the final number yourself. It is a bit tricky and we'll reduce it together afterwards. OK, the purpose of this exercise was to reveal a few things. Firstly, when the formal parameter names of a lambda abstraction are not unique, like in this case where both lambda abstractions have variables named x, things can get confusing. How can we identify what we need to substitute for when applying the function? Well, we just need to follow the rules correctly. So the first thing to do is to look at the body of the lambda abstraction. That's highlighted here in red. The incorrect thing to do would be to replace all occurrences of x with the value that was applied, which in this case was 9. Remember, we have to identify the free occurrences and replace those only. So in this case, the only free occurrence is the one outside of the body of the inner lambda abstraction. So we perform the beta reduction by copying the body of the lambda abstraction and replacing that particular occurrence of x with the value. Now we have another lambda abstraction and we want to beta reduce that. So we perform the beta reduction by copying the body of the lambda abstraction, replacing the free occurrences of the formal parameter, this time with the value 9. In this case, the only x in the lambda abstraction body is free, so we can replace that. And now, to reduce our arithmetic functions, we can use the delta rules. 9 minus 1 is 8, 8 plus 3 is 11, and that's the final answer. This example was slightly more difficult than the others, but it's important to see so that you understand how confusing things can become when there is a name clash. This leads us on to the next type of rule, which is known as alpha conversion. Consider the following lambda expression. Let's try to perform a beta reduction here, in the same way we have been doing so far. First, we consider the body of the lambda expression, which I have highlighted in red. The two f variables occur free in the body. So we perform the beta reduction by copying the body of the lambda abstraction, replacing the free occurrences of f with the argument x. This is actually an incorrect thing to do, because the variable we are replacing it with, x, is already used as a formal parameter inside the body. We cannot replace a variable with another variable which is already captured by the inner binding because there is a clash. This is known as the name capture problem. To fix the issue, we need alpha conversion. If we just change the name of the formal parameter x, along with all of its occurrences in the original expression, to something else, then surely they ought to be equivalent. Changing the name of a formal parameter, as long as it's done consistently, is known as alpha conversion and sometimes, like here, it is actually necessary. Since all we are doing is changing the name of the parameter and its occurrences, alpha conversion is also sometimes known as alpha renaming. Let's go back to our original expression and try to reduce it again. We recognize it suffers from the name capture problem, so the first step in the reduction is to perform an alpha conversion on it, changing the occurrences of x to another name. For our purposes, we use the name y. There is no name capture problem in the new expression, and so we can now safely perform our beta reduction. We do this by copying the body of the lambda abstraction, replacing the free occurrences of f with x again. When we compare the correct reduction to the incorrect one, we can see why it is necessary to perform the alpha conversion. We define alpha conversion formally as when we have a lambda abstraction with a formal parameter named x and a function body of expression e and y is not free in e, then it is alpha converted by replacing the formal lambda parameter x to y and replacing occurrences of x in the expression e with y. Just like the beta reduction formal definition, don't worry if you don't understand it, 
I'm just including the definition here for completeness. You can think of alpha conversion as just changing the name of a parameter and all of its occurrences within a lambda abstraction. For our purposes, that will suffice. In summary, alpha conversion, or alpha renaming as it is sometimes called, is another reduction rule which is sometimes necessary to perform before applying a beta reduction. Some compilers include an alpha conversion stage so that all variable names become unique. This is done to simplify subsequent processing and avoid any potential name capture problems. Consider the following two lambda expressions. The first one contains a lambda abstraction, but the second does not. But in essence, the two expressions ought to be equivalent, right? They each take a parameter and add the number 1 to it. In the first case, the parameter is formally defined with the x, and in the second case, the parameter is implicit because you are using the plus function, which needs two parameters to operate on. Here is where eta conversion kicks in. Eta conversion is another reduction rule. If we have two expressions, which behave in exactly the same way when an argument is applied, then they can be eta converted into each other. Eta conversion is also known as eta reduction. An eta reduction allows us to replace the first expression, which is a lambda abstraction, with the simpler second expression, which does not contain a lambda abstraction. Eta reduction allows us to eliminate the lambda abstraction and so is sometimes said to be an optimization. Strictly speaking, you don't actually need it, but sometimes it does make a lambda expression simpler and compilers can perform it to optimize code. Formally, we can define eta conversion as when we have a lambda abstraction with a formal parameter x, and x is not free in e, and e denotes a function, it can be eta reduced to just the e. Let's summarize each of the evaluation rules we have learnt about. Delta rules are used to evaluate built-in functions such as mathematical functions. Beta rules are used to reduce an expression. A beta reduction is the result of applying a lambda abstraction to its argument. We do this by copying the body of the lambda abstraction and replacing all free occurrences of the formal parameter with the argument. An alpha conversion is used to rename variables within a lambda expression. This is sometimes needed before performing a beta reduction to prevent the name capture problem from occurring. An eta reduction is an optimization which can be used to replace one lambda expression with another simpler one. That's it for the evaluation rules. Now we'll look at the different evaluation orders. If an expression contains no more reducible expressions within it, then evaluation is complete and it is said to be in normal form. Effectively, evaluation of a lambda calculus program consists of successively reducing all of the reducible expressions of the program until it is in normal form. Let's consider the following. There are two orders in which this expression can be reduced. In reduction order 1, we always choose the leftmost reducible expression and reduce that. Let's go through the steps. The first step is to identify the leftmost reducible expression and then reduce it. We then again choose the leftmost reducible and reduce that. And then we reduce the final leftmost reducible expression to reach the normal form of 68. Remember, it's called the normal form because there are no more reducible expressions. Now with the second reduction order, we choose the other reducible expression first and reduce it to get the value of 56. Next we reduce the other expression to get 12 and then we reduce the final expression to reach the normal form of 68. In this case, both reduction orders ended with the same result, but as you will see in a minute, that is not always going to happen and so the choice of reduction order can be important. Let's look at a particular expression together. We know from what we have covered before that to do a beta reduction we need to copy the body of the lambda abstraction and replace it with the argument. I've highlighted the body of the lambda abstraction in red and the argument we need to overwrite it with in blue. In this case, if we do the actual reduction then we get the same expression back and if we reduce that we get the same expression again. What we have here is an infinite loop. This expression will never terminate. It is important to note that whereas some reduction orders may reach normal form, others will not. Consider the following expression. 
if we choose to evaluate the expression in blue first, then we will never terminate. It is the same expression as it was above, and we know that this will end up in an infinite loop. However, if we choose to evaluate the expression in black first, then we will immediately terminate with a 3. That's because you can see that the lambda abstraction just disregards the argument that is applied and always returns 3, and since after that reduction there are no more reducible expressions, we have reached normal form. One thing to note here is that we are using a reduction order in which we are disregarding the arguments. This is a type of lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation is the default of some programming languages like Haskell. Sometimes it pays to be lazy, like in this situation, and sometimes it pays to be eager and evaluate the argument first. Now all of this brings about a few questions. Firstly, can we know if an expression has a normal form? In our case, for the simple expression above, we can work it out by hand that it does have a normal form. But in general, if we imagine a real problem which could consist of potentially billions or trillions of expressions, we cannot know whether an expression has a normal form. It is said to be undecidable. Another question we have is can two different reduction order sequences lead to different normal forms? The short answer, fortunately, is no. But that leads us on to our next topic, the church rosser theorems. There are two church rosser theorems which we will quickly cover. The theorems and their proofs are not really important for us to understand. What is more important is what results as a corollary of the theorems. The first theorem states that if E1 is reducible to E2, then there exists an expression E such that E1 can be reduced to E and E2 can be reduced to E. Don't worry if you don't understand this. Like I said, it's more important to understand the corollaries. And so a corollary of this theorem is that we can say that there will only ever exist a single normal form for an expression. So of all reduction sequences, those which do terminate will reach the same result. That's definitely a good thing to know. The second theorem concerns the order in which reduction occurs. If E1 reduces to E2 and E2 is in normal form, then there exists something known as a normal order reduction sequence from E1 to E2. This essentially says that if the sequence does terminate and you follow normal order reduction, you are guaranteed to find the terminated result. We know from the first theorem that you can never get a wrong answer if it does terminate, and so at worst, what you can get is non-termination. Normal order is defined as reducing the leftmost outermost reducible expression until no more reducible expressions exist. This is the order which we used on the previous slide to terminate our expression rather than ending up in an infinite loop. I've just covered these theorems for completeness. You won't really be using them at all when you start writing functional programming code. The key thing I wanted you to see was on the previous slide, where we saw that normal order reduction allows for lazy evaluation. That is, only evaluating the bare minimum to reach normal form. We've covered a lot in this video, and it has been very much focused on theory. We started by answering the question, what is the lambda calculus, and understood that it is a system for expressing computation. We then went on to explore the lambda calculus by understanding how we can define a function as a lambda abstraction, and understanding the syntax of the simple, untyped lambda calculus. We then covered the evaluation rules, delta rules, beta reduction, alpha conversion, and eta conversion. And then we saw the different reduction orders which we can use to reduce a lambda calculus expression, as well as understanding that when there are no more reducible expressions, it is known as normal form. Finally, we covered the church rosser theorems and understood that if an expression terminates, then there can only ever be one normal form. And if an expression does terminate, then there exists an order in which we can evaluate the expression which will result in the normal form. That's it for this video on the lambda calculus. Hopefully, you will find this theory valuable when you actually go on to using a functional programming language like Haskell, F-sharp, OCaml, or SML. Good luck!